Amen. Woo. Amen. Amen. We'll get. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, there's there's times, Dinah, when I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop. Amen. Hey, he's here today. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Before I dismiss the kiddos to Children's Church, just want to give you a few announcements. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, here coming up... Uh, Resurrection Sunday is, is next Sunday. Y'all know that? Yes. Y'all yep. know that? Yes. yes next Sunday's Resurrection Sunday. Yes. I pray that you uh, I pray that you're here. I pray that you come bring family members. I pray that you bring your bring your neighbors. Thank you, Bring everybody. Yes. They need to hear about Jesus. Absolutely. The world needs to hear about Jesus. Amen. Yes. Amen. How are they going to hear it if we're not speaking it? How are they going to see Jesus if we're not acting like it? Yes, Lord. That's so true. I'm not speaking a condemning word, but mm -hmm. if people aren't seeing Jesus in me, who are they seeing? If, G if they're not seeing Jesus in you, who are they seeing? That's right. Yes, Lord. I mean, folks, that, this is something that's, that's it's here. It's right now. This uh, next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And then the Sunday after that is our 37th anniversary here at New Covenant Church. 37 years ago, April the 11th, 1984, New Covenant was born in both Sandra and Charles Wolfe. God spoke a word to them. They wanted, they wanted to give up and walk away. And I, I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, I, I had a moment of meltdown. And I ask you to forgive me for the thoughts that I, that I had thought and the things that I had said. Not that I was saying anything bad, but just I was believing a lie from the enemy. Jesus. Yes. But 37 years ago, they wanted to walk away and go do something else. But God spoke a word in them, and they trusted Him. They put faith and hope in Christ. They put their hope, their faith in Him. They sold out 100% and trusted Him and stepped out on nothing, what looked like nothing, but God had a lot. And as a result, 37 years later, you see New Covenant still here, still doing what God started then. God is not done with New Covenant Church. Amen? Yes, sir. Amen. And I'm telling you now, church, we need to rise up and we need to show not only our community, but we need to show our region. We need to show our city. We need to show our nation. Yes. That we are not walking away and we are not giving up on what God put us here to do. We are a lighthouse. We are truly a lighthouse. We are giving light and we're giving hope to people in need. Amen. Sir, amen. Have y'all heard that before? Yes, sir. We're giving light yes, and we're sir. giving hope to people in need. Yes. Right. Amen. And very simply said. Very simply said, we are leading people and we're following Christ. Amen. That's what's on the sign out there by the highway. Right. We are leading people and we're following Christ. And if we're not following Christ, who are you following? Yeah. Come on. But uh, two Saturdays from now, April the 10th, we have our, our first Saturday, Saturday food distribution. Uh, Salt and Light Ministries, Kagan Dupree. Uh, we're gonna, we're moving. Everybody probably already knows we're moving our food distribution from Mondays to Saturdays. We we need as many volunteers as possible that are willing to work. Just because you signed up on the volunteer list doesn't mean you're going to have to volunteer every single uh, time we do it. But it gives us a running list to start creating some work lists so that the workload can be spread out over many people. 
Many hands make a light load. That's right. Amen. That's right. So I want to encourage you to get on that sign up list. It's on a table back there in the makeshift coffee area. And on that same table is a sign up for children's ministry and tiny tots. And so you can get with Andrea Reyes on that. She's needing volunteers as well for a long time. You know, listen, I'm just going to be honest with you. It has not been easy over the past 12 months. We've all been going through it together. Yes. We've all been going through COVID. No one's exempt from the COVID garbage. Okay, it's, it's affected everybody in one way or another. If it hasn't affected you spiritually, it's affected you physically. If it hasn't affected you physically, it's affected you emotionally. If it hasn't affected you in one way or another of that, I don't know what to tell you, but it's affecting everybody in some way. We, 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 we almost lost all of our volunteer base because people quit coming for a short amount of time because they, they, they did not want to, you know, be around people. They wanted to kind of stay away to their cells and, and being safe is okay. Mm -hmm. But we need to rebuild this volunteer base. We need to build it back up to what it used to be. There for a while we didn't have children's ministry. We had to back away from children's ministry. Now we're back into the children's ministry and we've got tiny tots going again and we need volunteers to help. Amen? Amen. Please sign up on those. Please sign up on those. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss Children's Church to you. Uh, all the ages of 4 and 10 you are dismissed at Children's Church. Once again, I want to welcome you here to New Covenant Church. For all those that are here in the building and all of those that are viewing us online right now, we want to welcome you here to New Covenant Church. Uh, some of you may be viewing on Facebook. If you are viewing on Facebook, we encourage you to share today's live feed with the world. If you're, if you're watching uh, on some other means, possibly you're watching on our website. You may be watching through our New Covenant PA website. We have, we have our live stream linked with the website. There are people around the world that watch through our website link. And maybe you're watching through the mobile app. And I, I really haven't pushed that a lot, and I've told you all that, but that mobile app is phenomenal. I want to highly encourage you to download the mobile app. If you do not have the mobile app, it's a free download between, uh, on iTunes and Google Play. Download it. It's New Covenant. Covenant PA. New Covenant PA. And it's a free download. Download it. You can watch live video. You can watch old videos. You can, there's all kinds of uh, what we're doing. The current events are on that thing. And uh, you can give through that. It's a, it's a means of giving into the ministry. You can give through that. It takes you to a secure link. Um, you can also give through our text to give motion. You text the word New Covenant. It's all one word, New Covenant to 77977 and you can give into this ministry in a secure form and if you like to write checks or give cash we like the big Benjamins but we'll take the Lincolns or whatever's on the ones I don't know what's on ones but you can place those in the black boxes that are hanging on the wall over there as you as you go out of the sanctuary amen how many people believe that we should sow into what God is doing amen Amen. Amen. I do believe that wholeheartedly because according to Malachi, many people use the, the verse in Malachi that talks about tithing, about giving, uh, that God will bless you because of that. But actually what that word says is he will rebuke the devourer. In other words, he will protect what you've got when you are obedient to what, what, uh, what you have. When you are obedient to what God has said, he will protect that. In other words, he'll sew up the hole in your bag so your bag ain't continually running empty. Amen? Amen. All right. This ain't a tithing message. What I'm talking about today is punishment. <laughs> Come on now. It, 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 this is going to be good today. I promise you. Turn, if you would, with me to John chapter 12. I, I'm sorry if I didn't give you this on the overhead. I like the way I, I, I told R, RJ this morning. I said, hey, scratch that scripture out. Delete that one. Uh, but we're going to look at something different. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, I'm reading to you out of the New King James. Now, just to kind of while you're turning there, John chapter 12, I'll give you kind of a little bit of background. 
Jesus has just risen Lazarus from the grave. And there's always outfall when there's a move of God. I want to read this to you in John chapter 12, verse 9. Now a great many of Jews knew that He was there. He is Jesus. A great number of Jews knew that Jesus was there. He's talking about at the tomb where Lazarus came out of the grave. Many Jews knew that Jesus was there. He was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only. So what they're saying is, is they didn't just go out there to see Jesus, even though they knew Jesus was there, but they, they might also see Lazarus. Interesting. They wanted to go see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. He being Jesus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And they weren't going out there to see Jesus. They were going out there to see Lazarus. But the chief priest, in, in verse 10, the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death. He'd done been dead once. <laughs> Jesus called him out of the grave, and they wanted to kill him again. <laughs> because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So they were blaming the Jews walking away from their traditions, their heritage, their lives and following Jesus. And they were blaming it on Lazarus. Father, I speak over your word today. Bless your word. Bless us to receive of your word today, and your word will not return to you void. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. This weekend is Passover week. According to the Jewish calendar, it started on Friday. Passover. It ends at the resurrection of Jesus. Next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Okay? You might say, well, I, I just, you know, I, I've heard people talk about Passover and stuff, and I just don't really understand all that, except I knew it was a Jesus thing. Well, let me just kind of, and this ain't my message today, but I'll give you a little bit of info on it. Passover started in the Old Testament when, when God uh, told Moses to take the, the blood of the sacrificial lamb and put it over the door of the home and on the lentils of the home, cover the door with the blood of the sacrificial lamb because when the death angel was going to come to the land, and listen, this was a curse upon the children of Egypt. Okay? Now, I want you to hear this because I hear a lot of people say this. They say, why am I being punished? This is my message today. Why am I being punished? Okay, let me tell you something. Uh, a lot of pe uh, a lot of good people have things happen to them. They're not being. A lot of people look at it as punishment, and this is a sad thing. Is they blame God and they say, "I'm being punished by God because of this or that," and and, and that's really that. It's it's sad and it's quite unfortunate that people are blaming God for something in their life. Because let me tell you something. How many people in here had a choice to drive to this church this morning? Amen. Amen. This hey, okay. Let me try that one more time because this is a full participation <laughs> church okay how many people by a show of raising your hand up in the air except for Sandra because she's she's all jacked up but how many people actually oh she can raise one hand praise God how many people had a choice to drive to this church this morning Okay, 100% participation, except for children, because they can't drive. They were forced to come here, although Emmy did raise her hand. <laughs> okay, so we had a choice. Now, um, on your way here, was it raining on you, or were the clouds dark like it was going to rain? It was dark when I got here. It hadn't started raining yet, but there's a chance of rain. Okay, so if it comes a thunderstorm... While we're inside this building and then it comes time to dismiss and it's pouring down rain and you got to run out to your car and jump in it real quick, you're probably going to get wet. Yeah. Is God punishing you? No. No, he's not. You are suffering the effects of that storm on your life, even though you're a good person and you just went to church and you just had, you just were a part of church, but you still got wet by the storm. Well, let me tell you something. That was just one effect of a choice because you chose to come to church today. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, and I, I started making a joke of this a long time ago. Charles had originally said it, and I just made a joke out of it. And, and people say, well, I'll see you Sunday. And I said, well, if it ain't raining, I will be there. <laughs> 
And that's, that's how a lot of people live their lives because they don't want to suffer the, the, the effects, not consequences, but the effects of if it is possibly raining when it comes time to go out into the parking lot, either before or after church. It's sad that that's what keeps people from coming together as a body. Yeah. I, I mean, really, people live like that. They say, well, you know, if it ain't raining, I'll be there. Well, praise God, if the creek don't rise. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, it, it's kind of like, well, you know, come the end of the world. You know, I, I choose not to participate in that hell thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, here's the deal. You're either going to participate in eternal life or you're going to participate in eternal death. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, even though a lot of ministries do that. A lot of ministries try to scare people into coming to Christ. A, a lot of ministries. And, and listen, all you got to do is listen to the words that are spoken from pulpits. Hey, over the next couple of Sundays, this Sunday and next Sunday, over the next couple of Sundays, you're, you're going to hear some words that, that are, are used to try and scare people. Words that, that carry a lot of weight. I'm talking about words like punishment. I'm talking words like judgment, condemnation. These are some really big biblical words that are used by preachers from pulpits all around the world to try to scare people into coming to Christ. And let me tell you something. He does not want you to be scared to come or not to come to Him. You understand that? And, and, and so the thing is, is, you know, you hear messages that, that talk about, you know, sin. We're all sinners, right? I mean, we know that. But we know it. That's what the Scripture says. It says it in Romans 3.23 that, that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, so that's not, that's not you know, something that is just, you know, but that Scripture will be used to try to scare people. You know, thing, statements like uh, uh, statements like like God is going to punish for sin, mm -hmm. and they'll use Romans six twenty three, and they'll say the wages of sin is death, and if you continue to live in sin, you're going to die. And while that is true, it's a half truth because we are all going to die. Uh -huh. We, every single one of us, is going to die a physical death. The Scripture says that we are all going to, we are all not going to live for eternity in this body. Yes. But there is a real you. There is a real you, the spirit man you, that yes, is either going to spend eternity in his presence or spend eternity separated from him. And the choice we have to take that path is here on earth. But see, words like that are used to scare people, used to intimidate people. And the thing is, is I hear people say, am I being punished for my life? Am I, am I being, am I being punished for the things that I do. And listen, people will not come to church. People are not coming to church today. Not, not just here, but every church in our community, every church in our area, in the city of Port Arthur, in Needland, Port Natchez, Groves, Bridge City, Beaumont, wherever you live, all around the world, people are not going to churches because they are quote unquote condemned or judged based off of the way that they live or the way they have lived or the clothes that they wear yes. or the way that they speak and people won't come because they're being judged and, and I'm telling you right now we, we, can, we can act holy we, you know we can act holy and not be holy so go ahead and churches are full of of holy, unholy people. Show. How about that one? Yes, sir. Put that in your pocketbook and take it home. <laughs> but here's the thing is, is if, if whether or not I got into eternity or whether or not I spent eternity with my heavenly father, which by the way, his name is Jehovah. Amen. But see, there's another father that's talked about in the scripture. Mm-hmm. And his name is Satan. Mm -hmm. And Jesus actually pointed him out. Mm -hmm. And he says, when you choose not to follow me, you are of your father, the devil. The devil. Yeah. I, I just kind of paraphrase that scripture. Yeah. Don't, 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 don't slam me for not quoting the whole thing. How many people in this room, how many people watching online have ever felt like you're being punished? Mm. 
in the past. Like, like you're being punished for, for the way you live. Mm -hmm. You're being punished for the things that you say. The way you live. You're being punished for maybe the people you associate yourself with. I associate myself with a lot of different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't come for the righteous. He came for the unrighteous. Amen. And so Jesus was quote unquote judged or, or, or see the word punishment. Let me, let me define the word punishment for you. The word punish means to inflict a penalty or sanction for an offense. That, that, that's the definition of the word punish. Inflict a penalty or sanction for an offense. So let me use that definition for you real quick. When our children come home with a bad grade, we sanction them. Yes. We, we, we lock them in the cellar and give them one meal a day. No, we don't do that. <laughs> But, but that, you know, you're punished. Give me, give me your phone. You're punished. I'm going to sanction you for something that you did wrong. And, and my daughter is in here today. My oldest daughter is in here today. And she could probably testify this to you. Uh, when, I would, when I would take her to my bedroom and, and tear her butt up, I believe in corporal punishment. Not me, <laughs> my name is Mike Halliburton, for the record. <laughs> But here's the thing is, is when I would whip her for something that she did, I always would hug her and tell her I loved her and say, why did daddy give you a spanking? Do you remember? Why? Put you on the spot, didn't I? Oh, it depends on what I did. I always told them the reason I, and I told her brothers too, I always... Or, or when I would do it, I would say, the reason I did this is so that you will remember not to do what you did again. Right. I always told them I loved them. I always wanted them to know that I loved them. And I wasn't doing it because I was mad at them, although I was, I was heartbroken. And there were some times, and, and all of them are different. Listen, everybody's different. Out of five kids, all of them are different. They all have different personalities. They all have different ways that they can be disciplined. Some of them are harder than others. Some of them are softer than others. But everyone is different. But this word punishment, and see, and this is the thing is, is we inflict things on people all the time. Let me, let me give you the next definition. For punish, to treat unfairly or harshly. How many people, so, so in saying that, I ask you, how many people have ever felt like you've been punished? Let me ask you this, have, has anybody ever felt like they were treated unfairly or harshly mm -hmm. in any particular situation in your life? Uh, I would think that probably every single one of us would probably say that we've been treated harshly or, or we have been treated unfairly off of a situation. Yep. The word punishment, to, to extend it out, so I just told you what punish is. Punishment is the infliction or imposition of a penalty as retribution for an offense. Very simply to be uh, rough treatment. Rough treatment. And here's the thing. Let me give you some synonyms to go with this word. Penalizing. Being punished. Penalizing. To be battered or to be mistreated. Here's a word that you may heard from the pulpit, buffet. To be buffeted. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul says it's as if the messenger of Satan was sent to buffet me. To smack me right upside the mouth. Yes. You know, and, and although someone may not walk up to you and physically punch you right in the mouth, you know, it, it kind of feels like that. It kind of feels like that. When you, are, when you are being punished, when you are, in other words, not being punished like sanctioned, like you, you're punishing your child for, for bringing home a bad grade, but I'm talking about being treated unfairly or harshly through rough treatment. And, and let, me, let me ask you this question. So I asked this a question just a moment ago, and many, many of you rose, raised your hands to say, I've been, I, I feel like in times of my life I've been punished. Maybe I've been punished for, for something that I did in my life. 
or maybe something that I continue to do in my life or I choose not to do in my life or maybe I'm choosing not to live a certain way and I feel like I'm being treated unfairly. I feel like I'm being treated harshly and I, so I feel like I'm being punished for who I am. It's like, it's like my personality is being punished every single day when people comment on Facebook posts. Okay? Or maybe I, maybe I put something on Facebook, which I don't. Y'all know I don't. But let's say I put something on Facebook. And, of course, there's always the Facebook prophets, the Facebook evangelists, the Facebook Elite. teachers, the Facebook holy ghosters. You know, there's always those people out there that's got to give their opinion. And that's all it is, is an opinion. Even if they use Scripture to back it up, they'll use Scripture to twist it and change it to their advantage and make it work to their advantage so that they can inflict punishment upon you because of the way you choose to live. Well, you know what? I wonder what people would have said if a picture would have been posted on Facebook when I was sitting in Flipper's chair. What? Oh, my gosh. You telling me that the pastor of New Covenant Church was sitting in Flipper's chair? Do y'all know who Flipper is? Yes. He's a tattoo artist in Bridge City. Yes. Your pastor is tatted and has been tatted for over 30 years. Does that mean I'm going to hell because I have a tattoo on my body? You see, because people try to drag scriptures out of Leviticus and try to speak condemnation and saying, oh my God, you're, you are marking your body. You are of the Antichrist. Go to hell, you sinner. People do that. They try to use the law to their advantage when we clearly do not live under the law, but we live under the grace of Jesus Christ who shed his blood on Calvary for you. Come on, that's right. That's right. I get so sick and tired of people trying to drag my past come on. into the future. Oh, come on. Yep. And yes, there are times when I want to throat punch people. <laughs> I am the pastor of New Covenant Church. <laughs> but that's the flesh side of me, amen? Yes. <laughs> that's under the blood. That's right. Uh, people say... I'm being punished. And I want you to know here, there's several points that I want to make out in today's message. I want you, first of all, to know that you are not being punished. You are not being punished for what you have done or are doing because God is not a punishing God. God does not inflict pain, does not inflict hurt upon you because you are choosing to live contrary to his word. That is not the God that I serve. That is not the God of this universe. But it's very simple that, and I, I've, I've said this the last couple of Sundays, and I, I've said it the last two or three Wednesday night classes that we've had. We, we have adult Bible study here in this, in this room, and, and on Wednesday nights I've been teaching about the sin uh, or about what sin did to the world when, when the mankind created, or when mankind opened the door to sin. Mm -hmm. And many things came in. And the thing is, is that, you know, and I made this statement about good people are affected every day by choices. That person might not have made a bad choice, but maybe the person beside them did. And so, therefore, they're going to be under the rain. You walk out in the parking lot when it's pouring down rain. God is not inflicting that stunt thunderstorm on your life so that you can get soaking wet coming out of church and you get your blouse all wet and your hair's running, uh, your makeup's running down your face. God, why are you punishing me? Listen, you ran out into a rainstorm and you're suffering the effects of a rainstorm. Amen. Quit blaming God because your mascara is running. You should have bought the waterproof kind. No, I didn't. Amen. So, listen, we are affected by the choices that we make. And listen, we are affected by choices that other people make. Yes. So true. So true. That's not very popular when you're talking to someone that, that just lost a loved one in a tragic car accident. Yes. No, God is not punishing you. But you are, you are being affected by the choices of other people around you, even if you chose to do what was right. There are people around you 
that chose not to do what was right mm -hmm. and you are affected by it. God is not punishing you. Mm -hmm. The next thing that I want you to know as I'm giving you this is that God isn't punishing you. He's comforting you. You say, how on earth? I don't feel like God is uh, comforting me. Listen to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 in the New King James, it says, Blessed be the God, of our fa God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Does that sound to, me, does that sound to you like He's a God that is casting pain and inflicting suffering on people when the Scripture very plainly says that He is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort? And, and many, many people might say, well, Preacher, what does that mean? What does it mean that he's a God of mercy? What it means is, is God did not give me what I deserved. He gave Jesus what I deserved. And I didn't deserve what I did get, which is what Jesus is, righteousness, pureness, holiness. He took that from Jesus and set it upon me, even though I don't deserve it. That is the mercy and the grace of God very plainly explained. That's right. That is what mercy is, the mercy of God. Right. means I didn't get punishment. I didn't get that because that's not what God wants me to have. God wants me to be comforted because He is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. The next verse in verse 4, it says, Who comforts us in all of our tribulation. How many people, let me just for the lack of a better word, how many people go through crap in your life? Yeah. Anybody? Amen. Just a, just a few of us. The rest of you are so good at navigating life that you don't go through troubles in your life. Well, for those of us that do go through things in our life, the Scripture tells me that my God comforts me in all of my tribulation. In all of my trouble, God brings comfort into that situation. He is the God of peace, and He brings peace into that situation into my life. It might not be comfortable, and it might not be what I'm wanting to go through for that day, but I'm telling you right now, when I reach out and I grab Jesus, He is the peace that I need yes, Lord. in the middle of that storm. He continues to say that we, we may be able to comfort those so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Let me ask you something. Has God ever, has God ever used you to minister to someone else that went through something you might have gone through in your life? Yes, sir. That's what he's talking about right here. Let me tell you something. He, he allows us to go through these things. He'll bring us the comfort that we need during those situations so that we can minister to other people who are in trouble. And maybe, maybe well, well, you know, God minister to them. Yes, he can. But what if they don't serve God? What if they are not church folk? What if they're a co-worker that hates God? What if there's someone that, that despises churches coming together? What if they're that kind of a person? He might just be using you in that place to minister to them and to show them the love and the compassion, the mercy of God. But we despise those things from time to time, don't we? And we're saying, God, why are you always punishing me? Well, God's not punishing you. God is not punishing you. We make choices. God gave us the ability to make choices all the way back to the garden. He gave creation the ability to make a choice. Do not touch this tree. Don't eat from it. Don't touch it. But a choice was made to do the very opposite of what God told them. But even in the midst of that choice, God made a way. God made a way. Even though they chose to do wrong, God made a way in Genesis 3.15 when he talks about the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. It was the very first messianic scripture that you ever see in the Old Testament. Messianic scriptures are scriptures that are pointing to Jesus. And by the way, just to let you know, every single messianic scripture in Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus. That's right. Not all prophecies have been fulfilled yet, but every messianic scripture referring to Jesus has been fulfilled, and they were fulfilled on the cross at Calvary. That's right. That was a little side note. He says, 
He's not punishing you, but He's comforting you because he, he, he comforts us in all of our tribulation that we are able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted, comforted by who? By who? The Holy by God. Depending on your translation that you're using, but He, he does. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit, is the, our Comforter. Here's the thing is, is the next thing I want you to understand is that God does not want us to suffer. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I know that I have even talked to people and I have heard testimonies. This is, this is testimony that people live and breathe by and they say, well, this is just my lot in life. This is the punishment that God wants me to endure for mankind. No, oh. ma'am. God does not inflict punishment upon you so that you can be a witness to people. God does not want you to suffer. He does not. Listen, because uh, it's in those hard times. I wrote this out. God does not want you to suffer because in those hard times, He will use those hard times to develop our character and strengthen us. That's what He does. He uses those hard times in our life to build character and to strengthen us. And during those most difficult times, just like a father, he will not forsake us. He will not leave us. That's what Jesus promised. What was he promising? Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 131. It says, in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. I stopped it in the middle of a statement there, but I wanted you to see there in that verse of Scripture that the Lord carried you. He was talking to the children of Israel that were in the wilderness. For you could probably say that they were defiant a lot in the Old Testament. And a lot of times people would say, well, God wants me to go through this punishment so that I can learn something. No, ma'am. God does not want you going through punishment so that you can learn something. That's not the statement that I made. He allows hard times to happen in our life. And he uses those hard times in our life to give us character and to strengthen us. He's not condemning you. I, I hear people say, I'm just being condemned for the life I used to live. I'm being condemned for things that I've said or done in my life. Let me tell you something. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send His world in, Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. You tell me how a God that sent His Son... That's what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him would not perish but have eternal life. How, why would a God do that and in the very next statement want to condemn you? He doesn't. He lets us know that in verse 17 when he says God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world. People take scriptures and they twist them. And they try to speak this condemnation. I, I've shared this before. It's 2 Peter 3, 9. He says that I don't want anybody to perish. I'm going to paraphrase that verse of Scripture. I don't want anybody to perish. I want everybody to come to eternal life. That's the, that is the heart of a loving Father. Yes. Let me tell you this. He's not a God of fear. The God that I serve is not a God of fear. The concept of punishment involves fear and condemnation, and we find it all through the Old Testament. We, we find this fear and this condemnation all throughout the Old Testament, but God doesn't use fear tactics and condemnation to convince people to come to Him. People do that. Let me tell you something. More times than not, preachers stand in a pulpit and try to preach, preach fear and condemnation upon people to get them to come to Christ in hope hopes that they can, they can boost their attendance or boost the people going through the baptistry. What good does it take for you to take a bath 
there's really not any cleansing taking place. Mm -hmm. Which it's not even the water in the baptistry that's cleansing you. No. It's the blood of Jesus that's cleansing your life. But God doesn't use fear tactics. He doesn't use condemnation to convince people that they need to come to Him. Listen, this is what it is. Hebrews 12, 5. And you have forgotten the exaltation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Let me use a different word. Discipline. Why do we discipline our children? To teach them right from wrong. To teach them. I, I, I'll give you an example. Because th this is how this is how God responds to situations in our life. We had a little birthday thing at our house yesterday, and and uh, children were swimming in the swimming pool. They were out there having a good time, and and the attention shifted uh, to birthday cake time, seeing happy birthday. You know what what all was going on at that moment, and so people's attention shifted away from the swimming pool. And uh, I was sitting there, I was sitting on the, on the bench next to my dad, and we were talking, and I was sitting, I was just looking out over the pool, and I was just sitting there eating, and then one of my grandsons got too close to the edge of the pool, and he fell in. And I could see him doing like this, trying to get above the water. And I just ran over there, I didn't freak out, Believe it or not, but I very swiftly and very quickly moved to the pool without dropping my cake. <laughs> it's very important. Without dropping my cake, but I stepped off into the water. And now, it wasn't Jesus walking on water. There's a sun ledge underneath the water that far. So I stepped off into the water, and I reached down in, and I grabbed him, and I pulled him out. Now it was very, it was very robust and quick, and probably scared the mess out of him. He was probably scared more so that he was, he was trying to get to the top of the water, but he just wasn't getting there. But when I grabbed him by the arm and I jerked him up out of the pool, they probably scared him because I stepped off in the pool and grabbed him and jerked him up and set him on the ground and very speedily rushed him over to where his mama was. But I let him sit there for a moment and then I came back to him and I talked to him very calmly and I said, you have to wear your floaties because you don't know how to swim. And Papa does not want anything bad to happen to you. So you need to wear your floaties in the pool, okay? And of course he said, okay. And I said, Papa loves you. You know that, right? He said, yes. And I said, okay. So I went on about my day. I went back and I finished my cake. <laughs> But that's how God is. You know, a lot of times in life we struggle and we're struggling. And sometimes God's just got to reach down and he's got to pull us pretty swiftly out of that current that we're in and set us on that solid ground. And he always reminds us, son, I love you. I don't want you to suffer the consequences of the choice that you just made. But yet we do sometimes. What if I would have just allowed him to continue to fight it? What if I would have, what if I would have reverted back to that pre-1995 Mike Halliburton? You better swim harder, boy. <laughs> You want to make it, you better kick and swim a little bit harder. That was the, that was the pre-Christ Mike Halliburton, the hard, no-nonsense Marine. 
no weakness to be shown. You better paddle harder and get to the edge of that pool. That would have been the old Michael. But that's not the God we serve, is it? We serve a passionate, loving God. Even in the midst of our troubles, God will reach down and say, Come on, son, I've got you. And he'll use that moment as a teaching moment in our life. Because to a certain extent, extent, we were experiencing the effects of the choice that was made to get too close to the edge of the pool. Or the choice to, to do something or to participate in something. And we get these effects on our life. And a lot of times we blame God, but God says, you made the choice on your own, son. You're not a robot. I'm not forcing you to do what you did. You chose to do what you did on your own. You know, and that's the thing is, is that God didn't make robots. When he made Adam and Eve, you know, and, and, and the thing is, is he made Adam. He made mankind. Mankind was male and female. I told the Wednesday night class this past Wednesday night, Eve got her identity from Adam because he spoke that identity on her. God did not name Eve Eve. Adam named Eve Eve. And that's a different message for a different day. But what I'm saying is, is that God created Adam, mankind, creation, both male and female, in his image. That's right. And in his image and in his likeness is compassion, is love. And in that love and in that compassion, we find grace, we find mercy, we find characteristics that, that describe who he is. Love, mercy, grace, all of these different things are different traits of God. And I just want you to know today that as I, as I bring this, this message to a close, the final point that I want you to know is that you cannot control everything. I, I want you to know that you cannot control everything. And a lot of people get into their mind. They get this, they get this mindset that they can control every aspect of their life or they can control every aspect of their family or they can control every aspect of every situation that they find themselves in. And I just want you to know that some things are out of our control. Some things are out of our control. Tragedies do happen. Loss of loved ones, it does happen. Bad doctor's reports, they do happen. COVID did happen and still is happening. Some things are just out of our control. I right, Listen to me, church, please hear me. I understand the power of our words. And I, me and Tina have talked about this many, many times and in much detail to take authority over your situation. And, and, and you know, I use the example about when we were in the big building and now we have it going in here that when, when we're not having church or when she's not playing the instrument, that there's music playing because we're taking control of our atmosphere. But you know what? I did that at home. I took control of my atmosphere. And I said, God, I'm, I, am, I am commanding authority inside this home. Okay, I did that. But you know what? A storm came. And it still blew my fence down. It ripped shingles off my roof. All of that was out of my control. And we will do take authority over that storm. Okay, I did. I did. I still lost shingles off my house. My fence still blew down. Maybe I'm not a man of God. When when Sandra fell in the parking lot out here, and we were we were waiting on the the paramedics to come and to swoop her up. We prayed over her. And I command no broken bones in her body, but she's got a broke shoulder and a broke wrist. So am I not a man of God? Maybe I didn't have enough authority to speak over that. That is a lie from the enemy. 
people get discouraged because their prayer didn't work. Well, you, you just must not be close enough to God. No. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm in his throne room every single day, and I talk to my daddy continuously. But I'm telling you, there are situations and circumstances that are out of my control. Does that mean that I am a bastard child and I have no authority in the kingdom of God? No, it does not. It just means that this is a corrupt world. It means that sin entered in in the garden. It means that there is a puppeteer out there and his name is Satan. And he is, according to scripture, the prince and the power of this air. But does it mean that I get kicked around by the devil? Does it mean that, that everything that I do and say, that I, I, I'm weak? No. It means that there are situations that are out of my control. But I can speak against the situation. Galatians 5 says that our spirit and our flesh are constantly battling against one another. He says that there is a constant pulling in the spirit realm against the flesh and the spirit. And since we are free moral agents to choose to make choices in our life, when we make a choice that is contrary to the Word of God, we will receive the effects of the choice that we made. But then there are scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I do have a very real enemy. And he is constantly trying to take me down and to take me out. But my God is bigger than him. In fact, he is defeated. He is defeated. And there is going to come a time when he is cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And the sad thing is, is there's going to be a lot of good people that go with him. And I'm not saying that to scare anybody. Please don't take it that way. I want you to walk out of here knowing that you are a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you can be a child of God. It's so very simple. Just like I was saying when I was in at the end of worship this morning, to speak it, believe it in your heart, to speak it. Well, it, it, it it's so simple. We overcomplicate things. People overcomplicate things. You got to go through this ten-step program to get to God. Let me tell you something. The only step you got to do to take to get to God is one step forward. A step of faith. Saying, God, I don't trust this little area that's right here in front of me, but you know what? I'm just going to take a step towards you. And you know what? He'll scoop you up just like a loving daddy will so that you will not have to go through the pain and the suffering that is in front of you. He'll scoop you up. I'll close with this verse of Scripture in Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good. Somebody say all things. All things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. All things. Does that mean good things? Good, good things will work together for good? What about bad things? That's what all means. What about tragedy? Can tragedy work for good? It can. It has. It does. And it will. Does that mean that suffering, suffering can work for good? Suffering can work for my good and for his glory? Absolutely. It has. It does. And it will. Listen to this. If we never experience hard times, how will we endure? How will we learn to endure? If we never experience hard times, how will we learn to endure? If we never experience pain, how will we understand healing? 
if we never experience the storm, how will we know peace? If we never experience the fire, how will we ever understand being refined? If we never experience the valley, how will we ever get to the mountaintop? Let's stand together this morning because I want you to know today that you are not being punished. Whatever it is that you're going through, God is not punishing you. God loves you. God is not condemning you. He loves you. God is not trying to inflict pain upon you. God cares about what you're going through. And so a lot of times when we're going through these hard times, when we're going through pain in our life, when we're experiencing a storm in our life, when we are in the fire of life, when we are living in the valley and we're saying, God, is this all I will ever have? I'm telling you today, he's not condemning you and he's not punishing you. He's waiting for you to call out to him and trust him. And he will make all things work together for good, for your good, and for his glory.